Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Wednesday, August 3rd. And here is some of what we're talking about tonight. The midterm primaries are getting even more interesting. Voters in Kansas rejected an effort to restrict abortion rights. Republican voters in Arizona nominated a 2020 election denier to oversee its elections as Secretary of State. We'll recap some of last night's big races. Then... Mr. Jones, in discovery, you were asked, do you have the Sandy Hook text messages on your phone? And you said no. Correct. A jury will decide if conspiracy theorist Alex Jones owes Sandy Hook families money for defamation. Today was a tough day for him in court. We'll show you why and break down the arguments on both sides. Also, Congress is pressing more gun companies to testify about mass shootings, especially about high-capacity rifles. A former gun company executive gives us his inside view of the industry. And we'll remember sportscaster Vin Scully, a legend who moved west with the Dodgers from Brooklyn to L.A. This isn't staged, <laughs> like one of your people said. This is a real event. It seems so incredible to me that we have to do this. That we have to implore you, not just implore you, punish you to get you to stop lying saying it's a hoax, it happened. That was Scarlett Lewis. Her son Jesse was among the 26 people killed at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Jesse was six years old. Mrs. Lewis testified in court yesterday, not over the shooting itself, but over the false statements made about the attack by conspiracy theorist Alex Jones. He is accused of spreading lies about the massacre through his media operation Infowars. This evening, the jury got the defamation case against him. It will decide whether Mr. Jones should compensate the victim's families and how much. Today, there was a twist in the trial. It could show that he lied under oath. Your attorneys messed up and sent me an entire digital copy of your entire cell phone with every text message you've sent for the past two years. And as of two days ago, it fell free and clear into my possession. And that is how I know you lied to me. Mr. Jones, in discovery, you were asked, do you have Sandy Hook text messages on your phone? And you said no, correct? You said that under oath. Yes, didn't you? I mean, if I was mistaken, I was mistaken, but you, you got the messages right there. You know what perjury is, right? NBC senior reporter Ben Collins joins us now in studio. Ben, we'll get to that moment about asking Alex Jones if he knew what perjury was in a second. But let's back up to kind of the foundation of this. Give me an example of the kind of harm that the victim's family say that these false statements caused them that they believe is worth compensation. Yeah, they said that their entire life was upended by these lies. And by the way, Alex Jones did give platform to these liars, basically. You know, they very early on in 2012 and there on, he planted the seed that this was a false flag, that maybe these kids were crisis actors, that maybe the families were crisis actors. Maybe this was done you know, by the government or something like that. Explain what that means, crisis actors. What is that? Yeah, a crisis actor in conspiracy land is the idea that there are no mass shootings or, you know, some mass shootings are staged uh, because the government wants to take away your guns. The government tosses in crisis actors from various different other shootings, actual actors, they think, you know, not real people. So that's what's going on there. But because of this, victims of these, sh of these shootings and parents of the victims of these shootings have had to move around. They've had to get away from these people who they think are, you know, uh, hunting them down or, or taking pictures of them outside of their home, which is what one of these parents testified this week. So we had that moment with one of the attorneys asking Alex Jones if he knows what perjury is. The judge also admonished Alex Jones today about telling the truth. Watch. You're already under oath to tell the truth. 
You've already violated that oath twice today in just those two examples. It seems absurd to instruct you again that you must tell the truth while you testify, yet here I am. You must tell the truth while you testify. This is not your show. Yes, I believe what I said was true. So I don't Yes, you believe everything you say is true, but it isn't. Your beliefs do not make something true. Is Alex Jones lying in court? Yeah, it certainly seems like it. Um, what we saw today, too, is that there was this cache of emails and texts that came out. It was basically his entire phone and the records of it from the last few years that seemed to directly refute um, what what he said on, uh, you know, in this trial over the last few days under oath. So, yes, it does seem like he's lying in court, um, and the judge has called him out on it. The judge has had real problems with both the judge and the judge's lawyers. They've been chewing random things in court. Uh, they've been, uh, Alex Jones has been speaking out of turn over and over again in court. Um, it, it has been a wildly over the top, almost like show trial to him. Um, there appears to be no difference between the character Alex Jones and the real Alex Jones, at least the one we've seen in court this week. Let's talk about Alex Jones's defense. He did in court concede that the Sandy Hook shooting did in fact happen. Here's part of what he said. It's 100% real, and the media still ran with lies that I was saying it wasn't real on air yesterday. It's incredible. They won't let me take it back. They just want to keep me in the position of being the Sandy Hook man. I really do want to try to change uh, things and uh, hopefully be a more positive force when it comes to issues like mass shootings. On what basis is Alex Jones defending himself? It sounded like part of what the defense attorneys were saying was trying to kind of cast some causal doubt in terms of the things he said and the actions that other people chose to take. Yeah, their defense is basically that, you know, it's the mainstream media that went to Sandy Hook. Uh, Alex Jones didn't send himself to Sandy Hook at any moment. Um, their defense is that, the, that these truthers came to this by themselves, but the biggest truther was a guy named uh, it was was a guy named uh, Helvig who went to exactly who went to the um, exact site of Sandy Hook several times and he was on Infowars. So that's his defense is basically the truthers would have done this anyway. But it's kind of unclear if that's true without this sort of platform. Infowars is a massive platform. What we learned during this trial is that it's a multi-million dollar operation. Um, you know, Alex Jones has been saying for years they made $100,000, $200,000 a day selling supplements. Turns out it's somewhere near like $800,000 based on the very documents that were leaked today in court. So this was a big operation, and that big operation trained its sights on the Sandy Hook parents for a couple of years there. And before I have to let you go, talk about what the results of this would be. This would not necessarily involve like the court telling Infowars you have to go out of business, but depending on how much money the court awards, who knows what that would mean for his business. How much money are we talking about here? Yeah, the plaintiffs are asking for $150 million. Now that's, you know, based on the $800,000 a day figure, that's a half a year of revenue, half a year of profit. So I'm not sure it would put it out of business, but that's, that's the full amount. And there's no guarantee they're gonna give them that at the end of this trial. By the way, there's two more of these coming up. So this is one of three defamation trials, uh, and just this one is worth $150 million. Well, the jury has the case. We'll keep an eye on it. Thank you, Ben. That's Thank NBC you. senior reporter Ben Collins with the latest from court today. We've heard a lot from folks about the Supreme Court striking down Roe v. Wade. Voters in Kansas made their views on it official in yesterday's primaries. They rejected a state constitutional amendment called Value Them Both. It would have let state lawmakers ban or significantly restrict abortions. Nearly 60 percent voted against the amendment. It failed both by a significant margin and with a significant turnout, unusually high for a primary. More than 900,000 Kansans cast ballots in yesterday's primary. That's significantly higher than the primaries in 2014 or 2018, or than the 2014 general election. Turnout was closer to a presidential or general election than any recent primary. Meanwhile, yesterday also showed us how much former President Trump still drives the Republican Party. In Arizona, Mark Fincham won his Republican primary for Secretary of State. That job includes overseeing elections statewide. 
Mr. Fincham has publicly denied that Joe Biden won the 2020 election. He also attended the rally on January 6th that was held before the U.S. Capitol was attacked. In Michigan, GOP voters chose Tudor Dixon in the primary for governor. She has falsely claimed that President Trump won that state in 2020. He actually lost Michigan by more than 150,000 votes. Joining us now are Dave Weigel, political reporter for The Washington Post, and NBC News contributor Alexi McCammon, the national political reporter for Axios. Good to see you both. Alexi, let me start with you and with the results in Kansas. Talk about what the political conversations have been like today in terms of how galvanizing that was and what that might mean for other races. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. It's good to see you both. Democrats I've talked to today, as I'm sure you both have heard, are very excited about the outcome in last night's election in Kansas with this abortion ballot measure. They're feeling very energized, but more than that, we see Democrats in swing states like Georgia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, really trying to capitalize on that Kansas momentum today and build on that through fundraising, through ads in which they're specifically talking about abortion. And the larger conversations that Democrats are having are that this is a really good, tangible example to use to further contrast their party and their vision with Republicans and what they say are increasingly extreme and out of touch positions. Dave, how do you see the impact of this going forward, not just for Democrats, but also potentially for Republicans and conservatives who have been supporting some of these increased restrictions? I'm sure that this pushback in Kansas has to be tempered, has to be put into some context. A little bit of context, but it was on the ballot in the primary because Republican legislators who put it on the ballot thought that turnout would be lower. They were dumbfounded by how many people turned out to vote for this. And you put the numbers on the screen, it was nearly twice as many Democrats who voted in the primary in the last midterm, which is a pretty high turnout midterm in 2018. Uh, so you, you, you've seen, I think, until now, some denial among Republicans having achieved the end of, of Roe versus Wade, uh, some denial that they would have to adjust their positions. I mean, I've heard some talking points that are just p- past their sell-by date. You know, I've seen Republicans say, well, we still have uh, more liberal abortion laws in France. Well, what we don't in, in some states. Uh, do you see candidates who were very comfortable for really about a decade saying Republic- uh, sorry, saying that Democrats had no restrictions they wanted on abortion? Uh, when I've talked to them, they've sometimes been on the back heel just when they get into details on restrictions. And I found this in, in swing state races, talking to candidates who say, uh, for example, John Gibbs, who beat Peter Meyer in Michigan yesterday, was telling me uh, he wants no exceptions for abortion except for the life of the mother. So rape, no no exceptions, incest, no exceptions. And he said that for the life of the mother, medical science has gotten so good that that's, that's pretty rare. Now, that is not, they, this is a belief. This is not something that's been poll tested. But this is a new position that Republicans have to defend. And it's very unpopular. So you're starting to see some Republicans wake up to how many races are we running candidates who are going to have abortion positions that are anathema to the suburban voter who might be turning our way? Alexi, let me ask you also about some of the Trump-backed candidates who won yesterday. There were a lot of candidates in the primaries yesterday across five states who have denied the truth about the 2020 presidential election, and quite a few of them prevailed. I mean, there were some races that we looked at as kind of a... GOP establishment versus, you know, kind of Trumpian, Republican, you know, candidate race, a primary to see which strand would prevail. And the more pro-Trump strand prevailed pretty mightily. What do we make of that today and going forward? Well, we certainly know that that style of governing and carrying on this sort of Trumpism within the Republican Party is appealing to swaths of voters across the country. That doesn't necessarily mean that Donald Trump will be as popular if he decides to run again in 2024. I think that's something that we have to keep in context as we're talking about these things, that these Trump-backed candidates might be popular, but that doesn't necessarily translate to how people are still feeling about the former president. I think, you know, the interesting thing is you've all covered and talked about, too, is how a lot of these candidates, these folks, a centerpiece of their campaign is relitigating the past presidential election, not necessarily putting forward ideas or policies uh, or talking about many of the issues that they say will actually drive the contours of the election come November. They're really focusing on carrying Donald Trump's water by relitigating what he says was rampant uh, evidence of voter fraud. But As you know well, the funny thing is none of these Trump-backed candidates can actually provide evidence of the fraud that they're campaigning on. And of course, when they win their primaries, the elections are totally solid and those fraudulent claims are nowhere to be found. 
Yeah, we should be clear that, you know, for those of you playing the home game, there is no evidence that there was fraud sufficient to change the results of the 2020 presidential election. That is why they have nothing to show, because there's nothing to be shown. But Dave, the impact of this, if these candidates prevailed, could be pretty significant in terms of, for example, Mark Fincham running Arizona's elections when he has fomented falsehoods about what happened in 2020. I, I feel like one of the big storylines this year is how much Republicans, how much voters rather, general election voters, want to relitigate 2020 and 2021, the aftermath, as opposed to dealing with issues like the economy, climate change, you know, the job market, inflation, you know, which of these sets of issues is going to prevail, that still remains a, a somewhat open question, I think, but it's starting to cha- take shape a little bit. Right, and we're talking about uh, state races where voters sometimes do separate how they feel about the president or how they feel about the federal government with who they're going to vote for locally. So in Arizona and Michigan, you now have, uh, with Donald Trump's support, very far-right conspiracy theorist candidates for uh, for attorney general, for secretary of state in, in Michigan. You mentioned secretary of state in Arizona. Uh, there are Republicans who have to run on the same ticket with them. And this is not what Democrats, when they've been in a similar position, you know, things are turning their way and they're, they're trying to nominate candidates to win. They didn't do this. In 2018, uh, yes, there are people... In in the in the in the squad who won, Rashid Tlaib wins, Alexander Cortez wins. But when they were trying to put up candidates in swing states, uh, those candidates didn't win that cycle. They're not winning this cycle. They are electing more moderate candidates who who you know Republicans try to tie to more left wing members of the party. It is it is a real risk, and one that the Republican Party is not resisting at all uh, in having candidates who are agree with Trump's positioning on the election above all else. And and Alexei was kind of saying it, saying it. This is not a top of mind issue for most voters. Most voters are a, a little bit exhausted hearing about this election. And you've seen even polling that shows uh, a super majority of the country, two thirds of the country ready, to, uh, not ready to vote for Joe Biden again, tested against Donald Trump. He's, he's still more popular than Donald Trump in some of these polls. And so instead of getting what they usually want in a midterm election, which is a, a, a choice, you, you do want the democratic policies, you want ours. Re- there are a lot of Republicans setting up a referendum, uh, uh, less, less of a referendum. Uh, they are saying, all right, you're tired of Democrats. Let's talk about 2020. That is not necessarily where a lot of voters who are unhappy with Joe Biden want to go. You're seeing that in some polls this right. summer where in Arizona, in some cycles, this would be off the map for Democrats. They're in pretty good position to hold the Senate seat and compete in these races. Gretchen Whitmer is a good position in Michigan. Uh, there are races that are off the map in Maryland and, and Illinois because of the candidates that have been nominated and because there's no antibodies in the Republican Party that stop them. Dave Weigel of The Washington Post and NBC News contributor Alexi McCammond of Axios. Good to have you both with us tonight. Thank you very much. Still to come, Thank you. billions of dollars for America's service members and a tumultuous week of protests getting Senate Republicans on board. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. A veteran's health care bill is about to become law, days after comedian Jon Stewart shamed Congress for not passing it sooner. The measure covers vets who were exposed to toxins in burn pits. Military bases used these pits to burn trash, mostly in the Afghanistan and Iraq wars. This bill, the Honoring Our Pact Act, provides $280 billion to care for veterans exposed to these fires. Yesterday, the Senate passed the bill 86 to 11, Veterans groups had protested for days outside the Capitol. The passage drew damningly faint praise from Jon Stewart. I will say this. uh, I'm not sure I've ever seen a situation where people who have already given so much had to fight so hard to get so little. And... uh, I hope we learn a lesson. President Biden has called the PACT Act America's biggest expansion of veterans' health care in decades. He plans to hold a signing ceremony on Monday. NBC senior congressional reporter Scott Wong joins us now with more. Scott, tell us just what is in this bill. What does it do? Well, you sort of described it. It's $280 billion over the next decade. Uh, for health and disability benefits. Now, uh, under current law, a lot of these individuals who had been exposed to these 
burn pit smoke. Uh, you mentioned, you know, burning garbage. You know, some of the veterans I spoke to outside the Capitol also talked about that they were burning uh, human waste. Well, this would expand these health benefits to people that were exposed to this type of, of toxin. And so really, really awful stuff. These are people that, you know, they, they feel okay. They look okay on the outside. They feel like something's wrong with them on the inside. They have uh, you know, problems breathing with the respiratory systems. They have aches and pains. I talked to one Air Force veteran, Jen Birch. Uh, she's 35 years old. She says she has these migraine headaches uh, that just make living, you know, just extremely difficult. She said she's contemplated taking her own life. And so these are very serious issues that these veterans are dealing with. Um, but now they have hope. They have hope that uh, they will be able to get care from the VA uh, for what they believe are these problems associated with burn pits. What was the holdup in terms of getting this bill to move before, and how did the Senate work through that? Yeah, this was last week. Uh, basically, uh, Republicans had supported this bill in the past. They put up a big vote. Uh, it needed to get some fixes over in the House. The House sent it back to the Senate. <clears throat> and then the uh, Senate Republicans uh, said, we're not going to go for that. So the veterans were extremely confused. They were ready to celebrate. And all of a sudden, they, they felt like they had the rug pulled out from under them. Uh, and so a lot of these veterans and the Democrats were pointing to Republicans saying, you know, they, the Republicans were uh, upset at this larger uh, Joe Manchin deal, that this was payback for Manchin and Schumer cutting this deal, trying to spend uh, a lot of money in Washington. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, it was, it was Republicans realized that they were in an untenable situation. I mentioned I was outside the Capitol with some of these veterans, Joshua, and the veterans were holding up signs saying that Republicans are killing veterans. Uh, Republicans are trying to kill the PACT Act. And so politically, this was simply an untenable situation. Pat Toomey, one of the Republicans leading the charge, uh, he was demanding a vote. He, he believed that there was some uh, a pot of money uh, in this legislation that Democrats were going to try to use for other purposes not related to veterans. Democrats said that simply was not the case. All of this money, $280 billion I mentioned, is going towards the veterans. At the end of the day, the Republicans lost their fight. Uh, they were trying to stand on principle, but uh, this was a, a political loser for them uh, in the grand scheme of things, and, and the veterans certainly let them know it. As we mentioned, the White House plans to sign this in a ceremony on Monday. President Biden plans to sign it on Monday. Scott, it's kind of remarkable, before I got to let you go, it's kind of remarkable that Congress could be shamed this mightily into doing anything. Are they ultimately attributing this to the veterans protests, to the political flip-flop, to Jon Stewart? I mean, what, what made the difference, briefly, before we go? What made the difference? Oh, I think it was the shame. It was, uh, you know, the images, hearing from the veterans themselves talking about how, uh, how much they needed this care and how much they had been, how long they had been waiting for this care, years and years from the Afghanistan wars and the Iraq wars. And then, you know, the Republicans were going to hold this bill up over, uh, you know, some procedural uh, hurdles, uh, really, really irritated and frustrated and uh, irked these veterans. Uh, they were camping out on the steps of the Capitol and were not going to take no for an answer, sleeping in the intense heat and through thunderstorms until uh, the Senate got this done, which they finally did. Thank you, Scott. That's NBC senior congressional reporter Scott Wong with the latest on the PACT Act, which, as we mentioned, is going to be signed into law on Monday. We will get to some of today's other top stories in a moment, including gas prices falling for 50 days in a row, a former official in the Trump White House getting subpoenaed by a federal grand jury, and the death of a Los Angeles icon, Vin Scully, the voice of the Dodgers.
Tonight's headlines begin with a consequence of the war in Ukraine, the expansion of NATO. Today, the U.S. Senate overwhelmingly voted to let Sweden and Finland join the alliance. They've remained neutral for years, but Russia's invasion of Ukraine changed that. Finland sits between Russia's northwest corner and Sweden. No word so far of any response from the Russian government. Meanwhile, heavy fighting continues in eastern Ukraine, particularly the Donbas region. President Volodymyr Zelensky says that Russia has an upper hand there right now. He described the situation as just hell. The UN estimates that this war has displaced nearly a third of Ukraine's population. But there has been a sliver of hope. The first shipment of Ukrainian grain exports made it safely, safely to Turkey last night. NBC's Josh Letterman has more from Kyiv. Hey, Josh. Joshua, Ukrainian officials are holding their breath as they wait to see uh, whether the first test run of this deal to resume exports of grain products from Ukraine uh, is going to be successful. The first ship left the Odessa port a couple days ago, then was able to be inspected successfully in Turkey and is now on its way to its destination in Lebanon. And if it makes it there safely, we expect that in the coming days the pace will pick up significantly with more and more ships leaving Ukraine, heading on to those countries countries that so badly need uh, those food products. But there are still a lot of open questions about this, as President Zelensky has been pointing out, warning people that this is not a done deal yet and that there are still plenty of things could go wrong. And we're still waiting to see, in fact, whether Russia will allow ships to return to Ukraine, bringing fertilizer that's badly needed here and allowing those ships to be restocked with more grain to head back out to sea. And now, as we are waiting to see how that deal is going to go, Russia has been continuing its offensive in the Donbas, that area in eastern Ukraine that has been uh, the battlefield for so many months, with President Zelensky now ordering a mandatory evacuation uh, of civilians in the Donetsk region. He says the government will help people leave financially and logistically. And as the international community tries to keep the pressure up economically and otherwise on President Putin for his invasion of Ukraine, the U.S. Treasury Department announcing new sanctions targeting people in President in Putin's orbit, including oligarchs believed to be linked to the Russian leader, uh, major companies in Russia that have been doing business in Russian-held territory in Ukraine, but most notably on a woman named Alina Kabaeva, who is rumored to be President Putin's girlfriend. The U.S. had avoided sanctioning her beforehand. Now the U.S. says it will freeze any assets that she has in the U.S., uh, get rid of her visa if she has one, and bar Americans from doing business with her as they try to put maximum pressure on President Putin to get him to end his war in Ukraine. Joshua? Thank you, Josh. That's NBC's Josh Letterman reporting for us tonight from Kyiv. The investigations around the January 6th attacks are moving forward, including with a subpoena of someone who was in the White House that day. A federal grand jury has subpoenaed former White House counsel Pat Cipollone. It's part of a larger Justice Department investigation. The department is investigating former President Trump's actions leading up to the riot and his efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Last month, we saw Mr. Cipollone's testimony to the January 6th House Select Committee. The Justice Department declined to comment on the subpoena. Gas prices remain high, but not as high as they have been. It may not feel like it, but prices have actually fallen every day for the past 50 days. AAA says a gallon of regular gas averages 4.16 right now. That's down 65 cents from a month ago, down nearly 85 cents from the national high back in June. But still, prices are averaging nearly a dollar more than they were last year. It's a similar story for diesel fuel in the U.S. A gallon of that averages 5.24, but that's down from the June high of 5.82. Back in 1958, the Brooklyn Dodgers moved to Los Angeles. Their longtime play-by-play -play announcer moved with them and stayed with them all these years. Dodgers broadcaster Vin Scully died yesterday. He lived to be 94. Joining us now is Dylan Hernandez, a sports columnist for the LA Times. Today's column is called Mr. Scully had a playful side that helped a young sports writer feel important. Mr. Hernandez, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me on. I want to ask you more about that column and your experiences with him in just a second, but talk about how Angelinos have been reacting to the death of Vince Scully. 
Yeah, you know, uh, even though obviously he's he was 94 years old and, you know, we'd heard in recent years that his health was in decline, uh, I think this still hit people pretty hard. You know, obviously it wasn't as shocking, say, as like the Kobe Bryant thing from a few years ago. But I do feel that, you know, a lot of the city feels like they lost their favorite uncle or their, you know, their beloved grandfather. Right. I mean, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, him having you know been here since 1958 and, you know, in a city where there's been so much change. Right. In, in, in multiple facets, uh, he was one of the few constants the city had. And, you know, it was just you know, and on top of you know, you know, just kind of being this omnipresent figure, uh, he also happened to be great at his job, right? And I think everybody felt the same way about him. You know, you won't find a person who would have a bad thing to say about Vince Scully. And, you know, frankly, a lot of, um, you know, and, and those of us that had the opportunity to get, get to meet him, uh, he was a lot like the way he was on the air, right? I mean, he was kind of this very friendly, very warm person. Uh, you know, so again, uh, he became, I think, somebody where, you know, Los Angeles has a few of these people, you know, John Wooden, I think, is probably in that category, Sandy Koufax, uh, yeah. you know, maybe probably Jerry West, where you have these people that are, you know, kind of the celebrity philosopher slash celebrity saint. And uh, Vince Scully was definitely, you know, probably at the top of that list. Yeah, I think, you know, and it's easy to look at like John Wooden, the former head men's basketball coach at UCLA, or Phil Jackson of the, you know, the Lakers, who's you know, still with us. But I think Vince Scully, I, I hear you in terms of a city like L.A. that I think get, wrongly gets a reputation for being just like flighty and frivolous and, and doesn't have any like real cornerstones or institutions. It absolutely does. And I think Vince Scully was one of them. Talk about the impact that he had on you. You wrote that he had a way of making the little people feel important. What do you mean by that? Yeah, you know, just that, um, you know, again, he would talk to you like he was an equal, like you were an equal to him. And obviously you weren't, right? I mean, this is somebody that was beloved and, you know, within the city, uh, you know, one of the most famous people here. Uh, yet, you know, in the Dodger Stadium uh, uh, press box dining room, uh, within that dining room, there was like another dining room for the broadcasters. Uh, you know, so he could have just kind of walled himself off and just had his meals on his own and, you know, gone to work. But, uh, for example, you know, he would always stop by the writer's table and, you know, talk to us and tell us jokes and recommend books and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, so to us, he was kind of like a friend. Right. He was a colleague. Uh, right. You know, and we when in reality, obviously, we were in the presence of greatness. What does this mean for the Dodgers going forward? I mean, there's never... There's a few people, you know, every city has got these broadcasters, I feel like, with, with baseball. I, I lived in San Francisco for a long time. Don't hold that against me. But I feel like, you know, people who live there know Crook and Kipe, the broadcasters who broadcast Giants games for years and years, and how beloved they are. And there's never going to be another Crook and Kipe. There's never going to be another Vin Scully. Who's picking up the mantle at the L.A. Dodgers? What do they do going forward to keep doing that work, but also to honor his legacy? Yeah. So, you know, uh, he retired in 2016. So he has been out, you know, they replaced him with Joe Davis now, who's also a national broadcaster at Fox. Uh, he called the all-star game. Uh, he calls a lot of major college football. And amazingly, uh, you know, usually following a legend uh, is kind of a recipe for disaster. Uh, yet Joe Davis, I think, has, you know, kind of brought his own style. You know, he actually, Joe has talked a lot about how you know, when he first got the job that Vince Scully called him and just kind of made sure to tell him, hey, don't try to be me. Do your own thing. Uh, and Joe Davis has actually, to his credit, done that and has, uh, you know, I think his own following. Uh, yet, you know, of course, I think for generations and generations of Angelinos, Vince Scully's always going to be the voice of the Dodgers, uh, just kind of like how Sandy Koufax will always be the ace of the team, uh, even decades after he retired. Before I have to let you go, very briefly, why do you think that he lasted so many years, 67 years in the broadcast booth? What do you think was the secret to his longevity? Uh, you know, hard work, obviously, the preparation. You know, he, he would find every newspaper article written about every single player. Uh, you know, he knew what to do with that stuff, right? I mean, that, you know, what he was best known for was kind of telling a story over the course of an at-bat about that hitter. Uh, you know, he somehow was able to, between while describing the action, kind of cut away from the story, and he knew how to pick up right from there. Uh, he was a really smart guy. And this is the one thing, you know, and I, and I kind of wrote about in the column there. Uh, this is a really smart guy, you know, and for him to yeah. have lasted, what was it, you know, as long as he did without getting into any kind of serious controversy 
shows again how uh, you know smart he was. Uh, you know, to avoid the landmines, you have to know where the landmines are. And you know, until the very end, there he was a guy who I do think was kind of in touch with uh, you know the sensibilities of his audience. Dylan Hernandez, sports columnist for the LA Times. Appreciate you making time for us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. Last month, a gun company CEO did not show up for congressional testimony. Now, Congress has sent Smith & Wesson a subpoena. More on what the Oversight Committee is seeking just ahead. Stay close. Congress is demanding information from one of America's biggest gun manufacturers following our recent mass shootings. The House Committee on Oversight and Reform has subpoenaed Smith & Wesson. The committee wants documents on the sale and marketing of AR-15 style rifles. Smith & Wesson CEO declined to testify in a congressional investigation of the industry. Marketing is a major focus for the committee. Last week, a former gun company executive told lawmakers he quit the business partly over questionable advertising tactics. He also predicted where he thinks the industry is heading. Any rational person can see the direct lines from this marketing to the troubled young men who kill people in places like Buffalo and El Paso and Uvalde. Anyone can see the direct lines to our nation's most dangerous domestic terror orgs. I am here on behalf of... That was Ryan Boosie testifying, and he joins us now. He is a senior advisor to the Giffords Law Center and the author of Gunfight, My Battle Against the Industry That Radicalized America. Mr. Boosie, welcome to the program. Good to have you with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Tell me more about... What made you get out of the business? What was the last straw? Well, I grew up with guns, and I'm still a proud gun owner and hunt and shoot with my boys every chance I get. But the tack that the industry started to take, um, you know, really in 2007 as Barack Obama started to lead in the polls, and then that sort of radicalization machine harnessing fear and racism and hatred as first as a as a way to drive political outcomes but then as a way to drive gun sales that started kicking in i did what i could to hold to my principles in the industry for a long time but um especially as the industry was all in on the trump administration and then was obviously profiting from you know domestic domestic issues like the kyle rittenhouse case or propagating um, you know, there are companies now that market guns to the Boogaloo Boys, right? There's a Boogaloo Boys model. Um, there's an urban super sniper. There is, it's, it's just gotten so far out of control that responsibility is no longer um, balances um, what the industry once was. Dig into that a little further. When you say the industry markets to people like the Boogaloo Boys, how precise is it? I mean, I can understand, for example, like if they were marketing guns with imagery that has to do with being a manly man or kind of the people like me who play way too much Call of Duty Modern Warfare and are looking forward to the sequel, as opposed to specifically calling people out by name, using the imagery, using the political rhetoric. Like, how on the nose was this marketing? Well, uh, the Boogaloo Boys rifle, um, there was just a bit of, I mean, as sad and sort of twisted as it is, just a bit of uh, divorce from the actual Boogaloo name. The, the gun that I'm referring to was a Hawaiian-themed gun, so it was finished in Hawaiian camo, and it was called the Big Igloo Hawaii, or the Big Igloo Aloha, sorry. Um, so it, as Big Igloo as in Boogaloo, Big Igloo. So there's just a bit of plausible deniability, but nobody with more than two brain cells to rub together has any doubt that the marketing is direct to the Boogaloo boys. <clears throat> the Urban Super Sniper, which is a gun that is currently being marketed, I don't think you have to use any imagination as to what the urban super sniper is supposed to be used for. The very marketing material says, for times when quick follow-up shots are the most important thing, as if Kyle Rittenhouse or somebody going in an urban environment um, to shoot people with quick follow-up shots needs to buy the rifle. It's Yes, it's marketed to manly men. Yes, the first, the first of these egregious marketing efforts was called the man card campaign, right? It asserted that you weren't a man if you didn't buy the XM-15 Bushmaster rifle, and you were a man, you got your man card if you bought the rifle. The first notable customer to use that rifle in an egregiously irresponsible way 
was a troubled kid who used the XM-15 in Sandy Hook. Um, the Buffalo shooter recently used that same XM-15. So these advertising campaigns are sadly, they're not just marketing to customers, they're creating customers. How do we suss out responsibility for things like this? I mean, two gun manufacturer CEOs did testify last week, and the committee's chairman asked them if they feel they take any res or bear any responsibility for some of the recent mass shootings. Here's how they responded to that. Watch. I, I want to give you the opportunity now to show personal responsibility. Will you accept personal responsibility for your company's role in this tragedy and apologize to the families of Uvalde? These acts are committed by murderers. The murderers are responsible. Re reclaiming my client. Mr. Killoy, how about you? Will you apologize to the victims here today and victims around our country and their families in Sutherland Springs, Boulder, and other cities who were harmed by your products? While as I, I grieve like all Americans at these tragic incidences, uh, again, to blame the firearm, in pr the particular firearm in use here that we're talking about, modern sporting rifles, thank you. to the, blame the firearm is an inanimate object. That was Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, a Democrat from New York. I wonder how we suss out responsibility considering that guns are legal. The Second Amendment allows people to own weapons like this. And there has to be some kind of division, I presume, right, between buying the weapon and choosing to use it to gun down an elementary school or a supermarket full of people. How do we draw that line fairly and actionably so that we balance all the imperatives here? Yeah, you're right, right? This is what a democracy is about. This is where the magic happens. It's the gray area. It's how do we balance freedoms with responsibilities and regulation. Um, two points to make. First, I don't think it's responsible to create uh, these egregiously dangerous customers to market to these kids. Like the, the Buffalo shooter talks about in his manifesto using social media to research all this tactical gear. About 15 or 18 years ago, the industry itself would not allow tactical gear to be displayed or marketed in its own trade shows. That was not a law. That was a voluntary responsibility. That was a voluntary prohibition. The industry undertook that because it understood that proliferating these sorts of things in, in our society could lead to very dangerous things. And if you look at now the 500 or more tactical gear companies, the way they market, it's, it's, it's a mixture of conspiracy, hate, racism, uh, praise of the Proud Boys, sexual content. I mean, it's a wonder that more 19 and 21 year old kids don't buy this stuff. It's, it's so far past responsible, it, it, it's, not, it, it's really not even in the discussion. Secondarily, it's not responsible for the firearms industry to not only say no, yeah. but to say hell no to every single legal restriction that might make this easier. Raise, raise the age of minimum purchase on AR-15s to 21? No. Or hell no. Um, universal background checks? Hell no. Like, and, and, the, and the firearms industry has funded and created this sort of vitriol and pressure around that issue. That too is irresponsible. Yeah. Is Chris Colloy right? Did the gun walk up and shoot somebody? No, a person did it. But the industry has responsibility for creating and furthering and doing nothing to stop these customers. Ryan Boosie, senior advisor to the Giffords Law Center and author of Gunfight, My Battle Against the Industry That Radicalized America. Mr. Boosie, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. History is not always pretty, but some Florida teachers say they are concerned about just getting the information right. More on the state's latest curriculum controversy before we go.